Good to see you. Good to see you, Ted. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Where are you right now? I'm actually in London, but tomorrow I will be in New York. <laughs> so okay. I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> well, listen, it's great to have you here. Um, class, uh, you know, it's great to have Paul Pullman join our first offering of the selective. <clears throat> and uh, I'm, I'm especially grateful given time demands on Paul Pullman and but I think I think we present to him an opportunity which is to have a really good conversation and uh, we're we're delighted that so many people from around the world are joining um, so I'm going to turn it over to one of the students Paul Fangia Jin is going to uh, introduce you <clears throat> Uh, okay. Hello, everyone, students from the Global Network and also the broader Yale communities. Welcome. And of course, welcome, Paul. I'm Fan Jian from GBS program. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's guest speaker, Paul Pullman, to you. Uh, so here's a little bit of background on Paul. Before Unilever, he worked for uh, Procter Gamble for 27 years and then took senior position at Nestle. He became the CEO of Unilever in 2009, uh, a tough year for all of the businesses across the world. But under his guidance, uh, Unilever embraced a groundbreaking vision that placed sustainability at the heart of its operation. And also resonating with the theme and the course of this course that compare and contrast the shareholder value and stakeholder value, Paul exemplified that with such a sustainable and socially responsible business perspective, it actually turned out to deliver a strong 290% shareholder returns over the years. And also in 2017, uh, Paul succeeded in averting a hostile takeover attempt by Kraft Heinz, a company whose business values were opposite, drastically opposite to the ones of Unilever. And so today, uh, beyond the realm of the businesses, Paul also a strong uh, advocate for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals across a range of organizations. I'm just gonna lift, uh, list two or three of them among a lot of them. Uh, he's a leader of the UN Global Compact and also ambassador of the Race to Zero uh, campaign that calls for collisions uh, within industries such as fashion and food. And also in 2021, he uh, co-authored and published the book I'm holding right now also uh, uh, in his place, The Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take, um, that actually calls, encourages firm that you have to step out to be bold, to fix problems and instead of creating them. So without further ado, please join me to give a warm welcome to today's guest speaker, Paul Pullman. Thank you. Thanks, Vanjia. Wonderful introduction. Um, and you know, for the Global Network and, and for uh, the students in the class, I, I must say, we're really fortunate to have Indra Nui and then Paul Pullman. I mean, my goodness. Uh, Bill George from Harvard Business School, school that we don't mention very often, but it's appropriate now. Uh, <laughs> He looked back in 2019 on the on the top transformational leaders and picked out four people. Two of them, Indra and Paul Pullman. So I feel privileged uh, to have Paul here. Paul, let me read you a quote of yours, and then I'd like to get a question about what it all means. For their own good, companies must play an active role in solving our biggest shared challenges. The economy won't thrive unless people and the planet are living. The good news is that addressing these challenges presents the greatest economic opportunity of our time. Multi-trillion dollar markets are in play across all major sectors of the economy. Traditional corporate social responsibility and philanthropy are inadequate for our times. Leaders must rethink what a business is, how it grows and profits, what its purpose is, 
and how it drives change in the world. These are your quotes, Paul, with Andrew Winston uh, in the Harvard Business Review. So Paul, could you say more about your net positive manifesto for current business leaders. What's behind these quotes? Yeah, no, thanks, Ted. And obviously, uh, lots of respect for what you're doing and, and nothing more important actually than spending time with uh, current and, and future leaders. Uh, for me, that's an important thing. And uh, I've always said we're short of leaders and trees. And having a program like uh, your uh, stakeholder management and innovation initiative courses is a key thing that uh, hopefully will make a major contribution as well as being part of the global network for advanced management of which uh, the Oxford uh, side business school which I currently chair is a member as well this makes it a pleasure to uh, to talk to you I think increasingly we'll talk that deeper but the interest of shareholders and multiple stakeholders beyond that are increasingly aligned which makes it probably easier to talk it now than, uh, than a few years ago. And, and thank you as well, Fanjay, for your kind introduction that uh, is, uh, is well appreciated. Um, Indra is a dear friend and so is Bill George. So I'm honored to be in their company because they've certainly been role models for me as well. The, um, I think COVID made us realize that, that we can't have healthy people on an unhealthy planet, that we can't have jobs on a dead planet, that we can't succeed if societies fail. And I think we are being tested right now. Many people talk about a poly crisis where a number of depressing factors have combined to create one big alarming super situation. Other people call, call it a perma crisis where we see an extended uh, period of instability or you might call it insecurity causing this one big super crisis. And you just have to switch on the television to know what's going on uh, day after day, the uh, burning effects of uh, climate change, of biodiversity destruction, uh, growing inequality, increase, increasingly the, uh, the sad uh, geopolitical tension and the list goes on. And it's clear to more and more people that we're using resilience of our life support systems, frankly, to enable a safe living. Johan Rockström talks about this, the nine planetary boundaries um, that we need to live in harmony on planet Earth, to live in harmony with planet Earth. And uh, unfortunately, six of those we've already passed. So there's not much safe uh, space left for a uh, just landing, to be honest. And we're at the point that incremental change, in my opinion, doesn't, uh, doesn't do it anymore. Arguably, the, the, the biggest challenges are climate change and inequality, and that's where I basically focus most of my time on. And it's clear to most of us that our current economic model, which frankly is linear, extractive, focused on output versus impact, is, is really not doing it anymore. Climate change is projecting to well uh, over 2.7 degrees Celsius still, and, um, and we're still going up in carbon emissions this decade by 10% plus when we need a 45% decline. And every day we see the devastating effects on that. Again, the most vulnerable or the most exposed societies in the world paying a disproportionate price. Uh, we see the same in the destruction of biodiversity, deforestation going up, extinction of animals. Some people call this the sixth greatest extinction. This year, World Overshoot Day, which is the day that we use up more resources than the world can replenish, was actually August the 2nd. I would argue that every day after, we are actually stealing from future generations. So we're living well beyond our means and yet we still see too many companies narrowly focused on optimizing their often short term financial return at the uh, expense of, of human or environmental capital or natural capital, if I may say. And that's not a story that can last. We are at the point now that we probably have come to the the situation that the cost we are incurring for not acting and putting our economy on the right path is actually significantly more than what we would have to spend to avoid the issues in the first place. Deloitte recently calculated that if we stay on business as usual, do all the things we do today, um, but nothing more, we'd actually just on climate change alone by 2070 would incur about $178 trillion of cost. Whilst if we would turn that around and stay closer to the one and a half degrees, 
we could turn that into a $43 trillion benefit. We've seen COVID, a direct result of the destruction of biodiversity, a zoonotic disease, not different than SARS, Ebola, Zika, Asian flu, and the list goes on, has cost in Europe and the US alone to save lives and livelihoods $17 trillion. It would only cost a fraction of that to protect and restore our biodiversity and avoid these issues in the, in the first place. Many of our uh, conflicts uh, that we see in the world, uh, the increasing level of wars that we have to deal with is uh, costing us 10 to 12% of uh, GDP. That's three or four times more than we need to address all the issues that we've talked about. So smart businesses increasingly, increasingly don't see it only as risk management, but see it as opportunity. Don't only see it as cost that we need to deal with, but increasingly as one of the more attractive investments. And, and what we can see more and more so is that companies that are moving in that direction tend to do better. And in fact, the world is moving. Governments have made big commitments. Uh, the, the IRA in the US Inflation Reduction Act is a good example of that. 90% of the emissions is now covered by governments having made net zero commitments. The financial market is making commitments, $70 trillion of assets on the management. Companies are making commitments, about $27 trillion worth of value has signed up to the science-based targets. Uh, so we're moving and we're moving because of technology, because of signals of the marketplace and exactly because of the alternatives not being too attractive. I think the biggest force of change is actually the economics that start to work for us in 90% of the countries in the world. Green energy is now cheaper, but also the signals of the marketplace, not least from the employees and companies. They simply don't want to work anymore for companies that aren't responsible. So this old economic model of CSR, corporate social responsibility, that deals with a little bit less bad uh, action, if I may call it, less carbon in the atmosphere, less plastics in the oceans, less deforestation in our value chain is simply not enough anymore. And we need to move from CSR to what I call RSC, corporate social responsibility, to responsible social corporations. And that requires a, a, a mindset shift. When you've overshot these planetary boundaries to such extent, frankly, the only business model that is acceptable is one that is restorative, reparative, regenerative. Uh, not different from nature itself. And that is what we call net positive. Um, in our book, Net Positive, we just ask ourselves two very simple questions. How can you profit from solving the world's problems instead of creating them? And is the world better off, yes or no, because your company is in it? Right now, frankly, I don't know how many companies can answer that in the affirmative, but that's really the mindset change that we need. What we see increasingly is that companies that understand that, that are moving in that direction, are getting also increasingly rewarded to that financially and see more likely a higher market capitalization. Uh, not least with uh, uh, Jeffrey, uh, uh, who is at Yale, and, and you're following probably his daily tweets or CNN shows and whatever you have, where he's looked at companies that have left Russia versus companies that stayed in Russia, short term sacrificing profits sacrificing uh, uh, revenues, but the combined market performance of those companies that have left has actually outperformed the companies that, has, that have stayed. Uh, an indicator that the financial market is also willing to look a little bit longer term and uh, reward that. The same is true for companies that have moved more aggressively on climate change or many of the other factors. So I think the market is starting to move and business would be well served to take notice. And uh, one of my life slogans is it's better to make the dust than eat the dust. And I think in this respect as well, if you're not heading in that direction nor accelerating, then I think you're already on the road to the graveyard of dinosaurs. Hey, Paul. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to hear you frame this in terms of eating into our capital our natural capital, our social capital, and you know, focusing on income inequality and environmental damage. Um, today, I think it's very clear what 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 the what the big issues are. 
but as you, you know, if we were to take you back to 2009, maybe those things were clear to you, but maybe not so clear to everybody else. And I'm wondering how your how you developed insights then that informed how you viewed the job as CEO of, of, of a you know phenomenally important company. Yeah, I I agree there's a higher awareness, but if we have the right insights and actions, even today I have my doubts. Uh, we are moving, but collectively we're not moving at the speed and scale that is needed. And we continue to create the issues at a faster pace than we're actually applying the solution. So in fact, you could argue the gap is still getting bigger. Only 15% of the sustainable development goals, uh, which are these famous goals from the United Nations, signed by 193 countries in September 2015 at the UN, and I had the pleasure to help develop those as a representative for business, have a very simple objective to irreversibly eradicate poverty and do that in a more sustainable and equitable way. In other words, not leave anybody behind. But then all the indicators, bar the 15%, were actually well off this trajectory. So the issue really is that most people have a capacity to think linear, whilst we're really dealing with exponential problems. So I'm not so sure that the awareness is at the level that it will be, but I hope that that will be unlocked as we're now dealing with these multiple problems of such magnitude that I think it is starting to create a higher level of sensibility. When I joined Unilever in 2008, uh, the company wasn't in very good shape either. It had lost significant revenues over the last 10 years. Its stock price hadn't moved for 10 years. It was basically rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic and, and frankly had become victim of short-termism itself. Um, the company, uh, the board at that time, decided for good reasons to go outside and I became the first CEO from outside of the company that, uh, that came in at a very uh, uncertain time. This was the height of the financial crisis and a company that didn't uh, perform so I knew it had to be changed and that's obviously why I came in and that different business models were needed. I took a page out of the book of Jim Collins from Good to Great, where he talks about um, nurturing the core before you stimulate progress. So I knew as uh, coming in from the outside, especially having come in from Nestle or P&G, that many people would have thought that I was the Trojan horse that was being led in the business. And despite being the CEO and running the company, I've always felt that you cannot demand respect uh, based on your position. You have to earn respect. So I studied the company a little bit more than others. I held my first meeting at Port Sunlight in the home of Lord Lever, who had started the company at the end of the 19th century. Um, many people were surprised why I did it, didn't see the meaning but uh, of it at that time. But it was really to go back to the core. And we studied collectively what made the company great? What were these values that we wanted to preserve? Lord Lever already in Victorian Britain uh, was, he made bar soap and was very successful with brands like Lifebuoy or, or Sunlight uh, because he needed to address the issues of hygiene in that time. One out of two babies didn't make it either past year one. He was there to solve societal problems, not creating it. He talked about shared prosperity, a multi-stakeholder model. He wasn't actually very occupied with the shareholder. He was the owner admittedly, but frankly, he was always spending his money before he had it. He built the houses for the workers before the factories were fully up and running. He guaranteed six day work weeks when that was a novel concept in the UK. He paid wages during World War One when the lads, as he called it, were gone to fight for the country and he guaranteed them their jobs coming back and keep, kept paying the women. In fact, when he went to the House of Lords, he took the name of his wife. Um, he became Lord Leverholm, which even until today, nobody else has done. So the man had a different way of, of uh, thinking and he called it shared prosperity. And I felt we needed to go back to the roots. Uh, out of that um, came the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan which moved from making hygiene commonplace to making sustainable living commonplace. His shared prosperity thinking was actually our multi-stakeholder thinking. The issues of the times might have been hygiene then. Now it was very clear to me that the issues were a little bit broader and probably more systemic and that it needed a different approach. 
Now, you would agree with me, Ted, that you cannot build a sustainable company if you're not sustainable yourself. You cannot build a purposeful company if you're not purposeful yourself. I had never been a CEO. I frankly didn't know exactly uh, if my thinking had any validity or the roads that we were walking would result in, in, in better results than what the company was currently facing. So I called indeed on my friend Bill George, who had written a book which is called True North where he talks about the importance of purpose, having a beacon, especially in uncertain times. And we, I called Bill and I said, Bill, I need your help. You've been CEO at Medtronic. You've been fairly successful in your life. You know, I'm scared stiff, as simple as that. And I said, I cannot do this job if you don't help me. So he said, yeah, yeah, you can count on my time, which I'm very grateful for. And for the first year, we spent the time discovering our own purpose. We worked that with our leadership team, the first hundred directly reporting to me, gave me an opportunity to get to know them so that I also could know their strengths, their weaknesses and, and how to think that through in, in evolving organizational models. Um, we extended that to the first 500 leaders. So we had a critical mass and together we developed this, this strong purpose that people felt really, um, you know, spoke to the heart as well as to the brain. And that was important because once you have that purpose well defined, you also get a little bit more courage. Courage comes from the Latin word cor, which again, it uh, uh, means heart. Speak from the mouth what comes from the heart. And um, we said we need to do business differently than what had been done before. We created a business model that already then decoupled growth from environmental impact, increased our overall social impact, um, created jobs for people that otherwise would uh, would not be participating in our our uh, uh, economic system. A, a comprehensive plan actually with 50 targets. But what was important was that it was multi-stakeholder, that we took a responsibility of the total impact of our business in society, not our just footprint or imprint, but our handprint, our total presence, that it called upon partnerships because the challenges were so big that we understood we couldn't do it alone that it actually already called out then the more transformative changes that needed to happen in our society and the role that business should play in that. So out of that came what is now called the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. And that obviously um, has really worked well for us over those 10 years and set an example for many other companies. Um, not only did it result in our uh, corporate reputation actually being at twice the levels of Patagonia 2 million people applying every year in the company. Our brands that were more purpose driven, growing significantly faster than the ones that weren't. We started to create quite quickly momentum. Of course, we had to put capabilities in place. Of course, we had to put measurement systems and accountability in place and a certain level of transparency to build the trust. But the exciting thing came from the broader partnerships. The partnerships were just not only with us between ourselves as employees of this wonderful company, but first and foremost in the value chain with our partners. If you take climate change from most companies, they limit their responsibility to scope one and scope two, which is under their own control. They think they can outsource the value chain and by doing so also outsource their responsibilities. That just doesn't work. We said if you're in the food business, you are as responsible for the deforestation, for keeping smallholder farmers poor, for the stunting of children by not giving enough nutrition, for the food waste, or uh, for the people going to bed hungry, or on the other side of the equation, the obesity. So this total impact actually made our company more aware of these issues, made the markets that we were looking at bigger, made our innovations more robust to attack these bigger challenges, made our employees more engaged, made our relationships with our partners um, more robust. And I think all of that ultimately translated in results. And as the results come in, you build some momentum. Uh, last but not least, I think important in this process to look at stakeholders just beyond your customers. For us, they were the community, they were the planet, they were future generations. I deliberately in meeting rooms would have a chair. I regret that I didn't have th three chairs but a chair that was empty. And that was the citizens of this world. 
because often we got enamored with discussions between ourselves or one function against another function. Finance wanted this, manufacturing wanted that, marketing wanted this, but we had forgotten what this was all about. If I do it again, I would put two other chairs in the same room, one being planet Earth and the other one future generations. So then you have to get the support of the people around you. It's not easy. It's an awful thing. We didn't have much credibility at that time. Uh, the data to show that this would give results were not really there, unlike today. Uh, but I had a possibility to choose a very good board. I never asked too much of other people. I, I like to give more than ask. But I, my only condition coming to Unilever was to move from a two CEO system, which wasn't frankly working, to a single CEO and to have a board that was more diverse. Our board, we were an Anglo-Dutch company at that time. We had six white Dutch people and six white British people. And it was explained to me that, boy, could they disagree. So there was a lot of diversity. But we were fortunate, fortunately able to change that quite quickly, made a gender balance board very quickly, 50-50. Even now, the first one in the UK, unfortunately, progress has been too slow. But also uh, two people from Africa, two people from the Far East, the first black American woman, Anne Fudge, who went to Harvard and some other wonderful people. And they were aligned in their mission. We spent a lot of time as we were discovering what we were trying to do on educating ourselves, but doing that in parallel with the board as well. And that support has proven to be absolutely crucial when you take these big decisions that needed to be taken, uh, getting out of quarterly reporting or um, reporting on these 50 uh, data that are there, running your business model all of a sudden for the multiple stakeholders and say that shareholder return is a result of what you do, not a myoptic objective, are quite revolutionary statements, at least at that time, that would certainly ruffle some feathers if they're not put in the right perspective. And then the last thing coming out of all of this that I've discovered is it, is, it just takes time. You know, you have to be patient. Uh, Stephen Covey in his book, Seven Habits, says it very well when he says, you cannot talk yourself out of things you've behaved yourself into. So there was no trust. I could see the financial market was worried about all these things we were doing. The stock price, which had gone up tremendously when my announcement was made, uh, dropped exactly back to where it was before when we made the announcement of our sustainable living plan. But bit by bit, we delivered the results. Every year, year after year, we grew top line, bottom line. The shareholder return was pretty healthy compared to any of our competitive sets and certainly compared to the market. So we won the investors over uh, bit by bit and the same happened in the company of course there were people skeptical cynical new ceo another plan someone on a soapbox but when they really started seeing the results coming in after four or five years and these more purpose-driven brands being more successful i think the penny dropped and momentum started to build so a cultural change that is needed is not seeing this as a risk but seeing this as an opportunity not seeing this as a cost, but seeing this as an investment, not just be driven by output, but be driven by impact, not just thinking um, compliance or resilience, but, but having this regenerative mindset. And I could go on, but these are some of these elements that, uh, you know, that take time. Uh, in fact, one of my former bosses said that, and then I'll stop uh, to make a change in a company. You need to count one year for every layer in the company. So that frightened the Dickens out of me. And at that time, Unilever had 14 layers. So it was a great excuse to move to five layers. And I think that move by itself uh, <laughs> served as well. So I'll, I'll leave it like this. Terrific comments, Paul. Thank you. Um, I want to get to a question about the range of stakeholders that you were thinking about. And what I'm hearing is you had multiple things in place. You had well, you had Bill George, True North, authentic leadership. You had really a, a crisis, so you had a sense of urgency, just in terms of getting the, the company back on track. You also had the, the resolve to go back to the company's roots. So that's what I'm hearing. You, you brought those things together and then worked on your immediate team and then worked on your next 500 and the board. The question though is 
how broad a group of stakeholders did you want to engage? And let me try to try to give you my you know, sort of fork in the road. You could have said, listen, these purposeful brands work. We can build value in the company just by doing that. We can build value in the company by making Unilever a very admired company, and then we'll get better employees. And that would have been a narrow approach. But I think you went further. You went, you had the three chairs in the room or in your head. So how did you think about, and this is a distinction that the class we're, we're grappling with. How did you think about stakeholders with whom you had a direct relationship versus all the others, like future generations, planet Earth. Yeah, I I personally, uh, it, it has to be holistic. Uh, by the way, moving to a longer term business model automatically brings you to multiple stakeholders. The first ones you look at are your employees. How do you engage your employees and create a high performance organization? It's not about just uh, giving energy or it's, it's really how do you unlock that energy and that comes from a strong sense of purpose. And then there is this feeling that if you do that, it's sort of fluffy that there is a big compromise with performance. And I would actually say not at all. Uh, Indra was always talking to uh, uh, um, uh, purpose and performance. I always talk to uh, performance through purpose. Uh, it was very clear to me that if you really wanted to unlock uh, an individual that you had to get to the drivers of what motivate them, what make them work together, what make them do extraordinary things. And nothing better than a mission in life that is bigger than just making money. Mark Twain said it very well when he said the two important moments in life, the, the moment you were born and the moment you found out why you were born. And I think that's even more pertinent now. In one of my foundations now, we did a study with 8,000 people 4,000 in the US, 4,000 in the UK. And we found that uh, two thirds of the millennials and the Gen Z's are selecting companies on their values. 30% uh, have deliberately left the companies because there is no, um, no correlation between commitments made and actions uh, being done. And actually the striking statistic is that over 60% uh, of people in companies are considering quitting for that reason. So we're sitting on a ticking time bomb. So the employee part is very easy to understand if you think a little bit, especially when there's a war on talent and, and many other things. But you need your suppliers in the value chain. Um, that's often where most of the costs and the inefficiencies are, but that's also where your environmental impact is. That's where your carbon footprint is. That's where labor standards are often more difficult to, um, to enforce. You know, are there livable wages? Are there human rights issues? Is there slave labor or child labor in your value chain? It takes a lot of work and many companies are not willing to embrace that, but increasingly are being held accountable for that. So we felt that that working that was our suppliers was our next responsibility. We created a program called Partner to Win, where we actually worked together with the 100 biggest partners. We had 200,000 suppliers, but we worked with the 100 biggest ones that probably were 70 percent of our procurement to really change the way we were doing things together. Also, a complete different way of working in our procurement department, which was used to just chasing the lowest cost, all of a sudden had to think about societal impact, environmental impact, uh, innovation capabilities around that. And that required uh, certainly some different skill sets. Some people understood that and could adapt, others not. But it was absolutely crucial. Then you start with your communities that you that you live and work in. We had a lot of people on contingent labor because it was convenient, it was cheaper, and uh, sort of under the banner of seasonality, they already were on the on the payroll for 25 years. I said no. All these people have to become Unilever employees. Well, it's going to cost us more. Well, we'll do it anyway. It's a principle. If we cannot provide decent work, it's probably not worth doing these things. So we found that when we made them permanent employees, their engagement went up, the attrition went down, uh, the communities in which they worked were stronger and became bigger supporters of us and, 
and all the things that come with it. And I've seen many, many examples of that. So that brings you to the communities. Then with the governments, I've always felt, unlike most companies, you're not going into a country to extract the rent. That's not a very long term successful strategy if you want to be welcomed in countries. We went into countries to look at um, could we help them with uh, uh, hygiene and hand washing to avoid infectious diseases? Could we bring in um, uh, uh, oral care programs in the schools when half of the absenteeism is about lack of oral care? Could we bring in nutritional programs? Um, we worked with uh, big NGOs that brought us to the scale that we needed. So USAID, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, DFID in the UK, or um, uh, Save the Children or Water It were big organizations that could help us scale some of these initiatives. A good example of that is um, our Lifebuoy soap, that most companies would position a soap as just hand washing and, and trying to do more of that. We actually positioned our soap of helping a child reach the age of five. Four million children die every year of infectious diseases like pneumonia, diarrhea, that could be solved by a simple act of hand washing. We reached over my tenure of 10 years, 1.3 billion uh, people with hand washing. We literally saved millions of people's lives. So that was a different stakeholder, very motivating. You can also see why the brand grew double digit year after year over that period. And people were fighting to work on it. So the stakeholders are different. The, the planet is easy to see. Uh, business depends on nature. All businesses depend on nature. In fact, we are nature, but that's a different discussion. But we depend on clean air. We depend on the water. We depend on pollination. If you're in the food business, you depend on healthy soil. And so the more we destroy nature, the more we destroy ourselves. That should be a concept that's easy to understand. Nature provides over $150 trillion of services that business doesn't pay for now. So the result is it destroys it. So we have to change that. And we were very well aware of that and probably set the pace. It's not difficult to see either that if you end up with more plastic in the oceans than fish, that people will not like plastic. So we were one of the first ones to create the circular economy, the plastic economy, made commitments to get out of that. I've always been taught in life that uh, you need to do the right thing to earn an honest living. And if you can't do that, don't you know, figure out something else. But we tend to have lost that concept under the red race of Milton Friedman's shareholder primacy which frankly hasn't really served us as well if you lift the carpet and look under it. So that's what we wanted to change in Unilever. It brought us to all of the stakeholders, admittedly the most difficult one, the future generations, but also there we thought about it, uh, Ted. I bought a brand, I bought about 50 brands when I was CEO over the tenure of 10 years, but one of the brands we bought in the US was Seven's Generation that is actually located in Burlington, Vermont. And uh, many of you will be familiar with that. That business has since tripled since we bought it or more. But all the things they do, they took the old wisdom of indigenous people and thought seven generations ahead. And their decisions that they took were simply better. And they built a very robust company out of that. I wanted that thinking in my company. So if anything, I called it a reverse takeover, just like Ben and Jerry's was, that really helped us change the big mothership but it's that thinking that we need to get into many more people that run the businesses today, because the other alternative is simply not there. Destroying nature is destroying ourselves. In fact, Hubert Reeves, who was a philosopher from Canada on the other side of the border, not far from where you are, said it very well when he said, man is the most insane species. He worships an invisible God and destroys a visible nature, not realizing that the visible nature he destroys is the invisible God he worships in the first place. So if we don't understand that uh, humans and uh, humus, which is the soil, so humanity and humus are the same, we are nature. And if we don't build that into our businesses, into our business models, and then we have the responsibility to future generations. It is incomprehensible to me, at least, that in this 50 years, we have lost 68% of the world species that in the short term we've been here since the industrial revolution, especially this generation, we've cut 50% of the world's forests. Uh, we've created an extractive model that where only 8% of all the things we produce are being reused. I mean, what gives us that right to do that when 
we should be stewards and it's better for business because if we preserve these things or think regeneratively we have uh, a much better society we have a much better chance of, of succeeding longer term so the issue is for me not that that is uh, so logical or not the issue is really how do you do it because sometimes you have to deal with trade-offs or other things that for some people are more difficult to make than others that's why ultimately it's actually a leadership issue we can talk about that that later oh thank you i have a lot of questions but i'm going to skip many of them but i do want to ask you about since you're talking to a group of students at top management schools around the world you know what's your take on management education i know you're committed to it i mean you and i got to know each other through your role as chair of oxford Said, a, a member of gnam but what what is it that you what what changes need, in your view, to be made when it comes to management education? Yeah, well, Ted, I've always said uh, we are just not creating the right leaders right now for the challenges that we have. The average tenure of a CEO has dropped to below four and a half years. The average length of a publicly traded company was 67 years when I was born. It's 17 years now. Um, the, the number of publicly traded companies in the U.S. Uh, 40 years ago, 4,800, now about half. Uh, we're killing the goose with the golden eggs, and we simply don't have the right leaders that can deal with the challenges that we now have. So nothing more important than investing in leaders and trees. And management education uh, is actually the most important one. It's the most followed education. About 70 million people take management education courses every year because they want to start their own businesses or whatever. So um, education is probably the most powerful weapon to change the world. And, and we can see that more educated societies are also often more powerful. And may I say, with a little bit of reluctance, often also more peaceful, especially when we make these investments in, in women and girls. So I've been passionate about it like you are, but I admire you because you've made it a vocation. But I chair the side business school. I'm on the the board of prime which is the principles for responsible management education which has 865 universities connected um, on the advisory boards of uh, esa in barcelona and the INSEAD hoffman institute in fontainebleau and then we work with 30 universities right now to bring our book net positive to life so it's very important that we create these right leaders but what it requires is, is to put sustainability at the core of the curriculum and most students are asking for that now and not make it an elective. I've done, I know that you and at Yale have done uh, significantly more and I wanna thank you on that, but that's not the norm, that's still the exception. So we need to make it lifelong learning. We need to be sure that we create these societal leaders, these moral leaders, these cooperative leaders. The one reason I like side business school, but that's not advertising here, is that um, it has the Blatfenick School of uh, Government Policy it has the Smith and Martin schools of, of climate science, etc. Uh, we need to create all round leaders. And, uh, you know, what I call these courageous leaders that have a broader growth mindset, uh, looking at these societal issues as opportunities to create value, understanding what these real true partnerships for society are and, and, and how to create them, uh, working across these different uh, constituents. So, a human-centered approach is, is badly needed versus the narrow definition. You know, um, uh, Ted, you know Judy Samuelson probably from, from um, the Aspen Institute, remarkable lady. And she was telling me they did a survey on uh, MBA students where they asked them when they went to school, why do you go to business school? Well, I want to change the world. I want to make it better. I want to make a contribution. Then they asked these same students after they came out of business school, uh, what do you want to do? I want to work for Goldman Sachs. I want to make a lot of money and I want to peep the world. You know, you know what peep is. I censored it myself. But, you know, we just we're just creating from wonderful human beings with our current system. We're turning them into little Milton Friedman's on steroids. And that's just not healthy anymore. So that's why it's absolutely important, not only uh, management education, you have to start much earlier. And you have to think about it also in lifelong education, 
because we simply cannot afford to to wait uh, at university level alone. So that's really what drives me, and it's one of the key tenets of what we focus on with um, the uh, organization I've created, including an organization for leadership development, which we call Imagine, which is run uh, at Oxford right now with the Skull, with the Skull Forum there, where we take uh, leaders from an industry, innovators, uh, government, um, um, people working for the major companies take food and where we bring them together 40, 50 at a time. Uh, we've done about 250 of those to create these incredible leaders that work on true societal problems. In this case, how to move to regenerative agriculture. So for me, leadership is probably one of the most important things that we can spend the time on. And that comes back to the initial comment I made that this is not an issue of climate change or food security or inequality. They're frankly symptoms. Um, and all of those could be solved with what we have today. We don't need California or we don't need Bill Gates' latest book on technology, nice as they may be. But um, what we need is um, leadership. Many will say that this is a crisis of greed, of apathy, of selfishness. So how can we create the right leaders to overcome these challenges? And we've been able to do that in in history, if you go back and I rest hopeful that we can still do it moving forward, although the window is closing. Well, you've sounded several uh, points about which we might be hopeful, but uh, I, I'm going to open it up to questions now. I'll just uh, make a comment. <clears throat> I think, Paul, your point about Saeed is right. Being, being at a world class university with potential academic partners around Oxford is a huge advantage for Saeed. I think it's a huge advantage for Yale. Why? Because the nature of the problems are, problems are so daunting and multidimensional that they're not gonna be solved easily. So being able to turn and, and work with a great forestry school, for example, it's very important. And I noticed that even the schools, the great schools and the network that are stand alone, they're developing relationships with universities. So I think that's a, a really important point. That's one of the reasons why I keep advocating that the students here at Yale School of Management get connected to the rest of Yale. I'll get off that soapbox right now, but let's open no, no, it up. Well said, well said. Um, uh, we're going to start with questions from the class. Paul, you should give me a little bit of guidance about how much time you have. Um, no, it's uh, it's uh, late here, but it doesn't matter. I have an auto talk with Japan, believe it or not, later. But I believe can, what time is it now? It's uh, eight thirty. If you want twenty minutes or twenty five minutes, is that okay to you? That would be awesome, and we'll allocate the first chunk to the students in uh, this new elective, uh, and then we'll open it up to the global network after that. Hi, <laughs> thanks so much for taking the time to uh, speak with our class. Um, in reading a little bit about your work and in your discussion earlier, I was very interested to hear about uh, the kind of change in dynamic you've created with uh, the stakeholders that you have direct impact on. And the ones that I think interest me most, especially in taking this class, are the relationship between a CEO and the investors within the company. And um, in the reading that we did a little bit about your experience with uh, the Kraft Heinz takeover um, or attempted takeover, um, uh, you mentioned that you got support from investors to not cut corners, that doing it the Kraft Heinz way would have kind of been abandoning the way that they wanted to see the organization run. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you change your dynamic with investors, what the future of that looks like, um, especially for us emerging managers. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Thanks for asking. I mean, obviously, the, the shareholders are an important stakeholder group, not the only ones, but they are an important stakeholder group. And this notion that companies need to make profit is also nothing wrong with that. I mean, in essence, uh, we produced a 290% shareholder return and I've always been a very uh, performance oriented. So let me say that um, I believe in the capitalistic system provided it works for everybody. So like you bent it with, uh, uh, the New Deal with Franklin Roosevelt being an example in the US where you bent the curve of, of capitalism to make it more inclusive 
get health care or social security and other things. We are in desperate need of bending the curve, but we should not abandon the system itself. Um, provided we can uh, enlarge the definitions by, as I mentioned before, not only optimizing the return on financial capital, but also include human, natural and social capital. I think capitalism is very well placed to deal with that. And then change the definition of success to impact and not output. In fact, uh, countries that uh, do economically well don't necessarily have the highest consumer satisfaction, uh, the US being an example of that. So, so there are other factors that increasingly people are looking for uh, in, in terms of overall health and well-being, quality of education, safety of schools or quality of air that you're breathing, um, enjoyment of, of, of nature and, and many other things. Unfortunately, we have a GDP system that when, when we have a lot of wars, the GDP grows and when we have peace, it doesn't. It doesn't quite seem right to me. But anyway, talking about the shareholders and how we enroll them, if that is your question in essence, it wasn't easy because um, there was a low respect of the company by the shareholders. There was a lot of talk of splitting up the company when I came. Um, low trust, in fact, in what we were doing. And then I came with a system that says we're not reporting anymore quarterly. We're not giving guidance anymore. Uh, I also had changed the compensation system, by the way, to a longer term compensation system. But many in the financial market were worried about that. They thought it's the simple trick of a new CEO setting its base lower and and trying to get into a better uh, uh, share option plan and, and enrich themselves in doing so. But my, my point was different. My point there was already then that uh, people in essence want to do the right thing. But, um, you know, no, no CEO wants more unemployment, more air pollution, more people going to bed hungry. But collectively we act that way. And the reason for that is um, the boundaries around us often drive our behavior. So a good leader works on the forest, not in the forest. And, and for me, it wasn't heroic to stop quarterly reporting or giving guidance because I could see that these issues that we wanted to address and solve, that were enormous opportunities that I wanted to put at the core of the company, required more than the red rays of the quarters. So I needed to liberate people from thinking differently and take all that energy in the right direction. It served us very well, in fact. The shareholders took a longer time, some shareholders to understand that. But you know, the battle of Kraft Heinz with, with Unilever, fortunately it came in year eight of my tenure. And I'm happy about that because I was a little bit stronger as a CEO uh, in terms of my own credibility in understanding the job and the, the challenges of the job, but also having built a certain level of credibility. This was not a takeover because of underperformance, unlike some people who want to present that. We actually had a shareholder performance before that, well ahead of even Warren Buffett, who was a major shareholder in Kraft Heinz. But so it wasn't about uh, numbers. It was actually more of, for me, a battle of the soul of the company, as I might want to say it. So whether you're thinking about the role of the private sector in, in tackling climate change or in, in bringing peace or stability or in helping millions of people worldwide um, getting out of poverty, et cetera, the, the question comes always back to purpose. What type of company do you want to run? What type of company do you want to be? How do you want to sell your products by making this a better world or a world that is worse? And here we saw quite some different approaches. We saw one model which I call the ultimate of a shareholder primacy model, where companies were being bought in a sort of a Ponzi scheme, where it was over leveraged financially, where costs were being cut, no investments made in R&D, but a few people were very wealthy as a result of it. So it was a model made for billionaires. Unilever's multi-stakeholder model was made for the billions of people, where we looked at the longer term and where we put the people we serve at the core of our business. And that was really the clash, both legal models one driven by value creation simply and the other one driven by value creation through values. So I knew what our people preferred. The strategic decision to say no was very easy based on that alone, but also it made it even easier because the portfolio didn't make any sense. You know, we, we would not want to be in the business of selling plastic cheese or, or many of the products or, or, or ketchup for that matter with, with a 
a thought of it being sugar, to be honest. Uh, we didn't see the, the product fit and we didn't see the cultural fit. That was very clear. And uh, we didn't believe in their model of value creation. It actually was the benefit of hindsight has proven to be right. I mean, they've had profit warnings. Even now, their value is below the offering value when the company started. They've had court cases, misrepresented the books. They've had multiple CEOs. Uh, it's not a company, frankly, I want to be associated with. In any ranking, be it human rights or being environmental, you go to the bottom and you find them there with few exceptions. And that's just not our people. That's just not our model. Unilever, on the, on the other hand, even after the Kraft Heinz um, uh, the the debacle, if I want to call it that way, uh, their share price went down about 70, 80 percent. Our share price went up another 100 percent, more or less. So I think the shareholders voted with their wallets. I learned one lesson from this is that um, it's awfully nasty out there in some elements of the financial market. I learned how important it is to keep your board behind you and stick to your values. I also learned a little bit more that at some times you need to be practical especially when the future of your company is at stake and willing to make some compromises but i i learned above all that if you stand by the world which was our multi-stakeholder model in times when goings get tough and this was not an easy time including for myself but the world will stand with you so if you stand with the world the world will stand with you and i think ultimately it was that multi-stakeholder model that that saved us uh, so that's really how i see the Kraft heinz game uh, that's why we put it in our book with a cheeky title how ketchup how mayonnaise beats ketchup but um this 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 um many ceos i'll stop there many ceos uh cater to their current shareholder base but what is your current shareholder base unilever had hundreds of thousands of shareholders some want you to break up the company others want you to pay special dividends others want you to sell some company brands and buy some others others want you to reinvest in growth if you would listen to all the shareholders uh then um you know you you um, it's insanity you drive the company into the ground none of the the shareholders has ever run a business by the way that are running so just a small detail so you have to take them a little bit with, with a, I, I don't want to use the grain of salt, that's the wrong word, but you have to put it a little bit in perspective. And then what many CEOs don't do, unfortunately, is because their tenures are so short in their own mindsets, and it's a little bit crap what you can whilst I'm there, they don't really spend enough time on nurturing the right shareholders. I always believe that, that, uh, that uh, you should proactively seek the right shareholders. That's what we did in Unilever. By not reporting quarterly we found out actually that our communication became more strategic and long term we didn't have to explain that ramadan had moved a few days or that the weather was wrong and ice cream didn't do so well we could start strategically talking and it took the speculators out it started attracting the more strategic investors then we proactively went out to the longer term shareholders over the 10-year period i write it in the book net positive our holdings of the the top 10 got significantly stronger and the other 90, we actually saw half the rotation. That's a significant change that nobody has really shown in other companies in a shareholder base that actually works to my advantage. So what do you need to do with these shareholders? Uh, you need to be much better in explaining what your strategy is and how it creates value, um, what, um, <coughs> what incentive systems you put in place, how the board plays a role in that, how you make them active investors versus activists, which is a different thing. So it requires a strategy that many companies, unfortunately, even today, uh, don't do. And yet we are at a point now that we see increasingly with some work we've done that the investors are pushing actually more for the longer term than the companies themselves. That's the interesting thing where investors increasingly reward companies more that act for the longer term or reduce these negative externalities versus these companies that continue to keep their heads in the sand. So, so it is to some extent remarkable that we don't see faster progress in that area, but it certainly helped Unilever and I'm glad we did that. 
So uh, next question, and as who, who wants to take the next question? Okay, a comment then we'll open it up to uh, the network. Uh, my comment is uh, just to let everybody know if you would care to read more about Paul and what he's thinking, go to his LinkedIn site. The class had the opportunity to read his views about a lot of things, but like you just mentioned, um, you know, various episodes along the way, uh, he's, he represents a flow of insights. So I would, I would encourage you to, to go there. Um, let, let's go to the network. So let's start with Sophia Faria, Sophia. Hi there. Hi, Paul. Thank you so much for your time and passion. I um, completely agree with you. Oh, oh, I'm also Sophia Faria from UBC Sauter. Um, I'm based in Vancouver and uh, Canada. I'm also um, an impact strategist at a small boutique firm called The Leverage Lab. So we help the B Corp certification. And I have a hundred questions for you, but my question will be centered around that. Um, I completely agree that we need businesses who are purpose-driven and find their profit um, from doing good for the planet. Like that's where the profit comes from versus the other model of now I'll set up a philanthropy um, <laughs> arm. Uh, so my question is about the B Corp certification as the way forward for, as one of the ways forward for organizations to align with net positive um, and I believe, I think it was in 2019 that Unilever shared um, that of the 400 sustainable living brands, 5% of the portfolio was B Corp, and that represented 75% of the growth. I'm, I couldn't refine that statistic, but maybe it's just a bigger question of if you could speak more to that um, and where there might be more data I could look into. Uh, Sophia, thanks for the question. And then as you know, I'm a big supporter of the B Corp movement and Jay and Kuhn, I talk to them quite often. And it's actually great to see that uh, uh, movement built to um, thousands and, uh, of companies now all across the world. And frankly, if you take a, a representative sample of B Corps and you put them together in a company, you probably will be more successful than most of the big companies by themselves. So the, the vision like Natura in, in Brazil or Danone, or Unilever to become B Corps has always been one of my ambitions because most of the B Corps right now are small companies and we just don't have that luxury of time and we need impact faster. So how can you bring that to um, the bigger organizations? You also talked that's one way of doing it. There are different forms of corporate governance. I first wanted to make the corporate governance point. There is this notion that has been crept in that the fiduciary duties of boards of CEOs who run it is towards the shareholder. And frankly, many people um, have written about that. There are very few jurisdictions, if any, that I can find that say that the duty, the fiduciary duty is towards just the shareholder. It's just not true, but we've all started to behave that way. So within even a current um, corporate governance model, which Unilever was like a publicly traded company, I think CEOs can be and boards can be more courageous. And one of the things that we're spending a lot of time on and more needs to be spent on that is educating boards on the new skills that they need, on the diversity you want on their boards in all respects, on the understanding of their fiduciary duties. Obviously the B Corp, which for people that don't understand it, have a specific corporate charter of, uh, of multi-stakeholder uh, primacy versus shareholder primacy that is protected by the state of Delaware in the US and more than half of the US states have now recognized that. And uh, most of these companies are uh, at the core have was purpose, sustainability, multi-stakeholder and, and very successful as a result of it. So um, looking at alternative business models is, is one thing that that is fine, but more importantly, it is still the behavior even within the current systems. Um, in Unilever, I was able during my tenure to to um, get seven B Corps to be aligned with Unilever. It was always attractive to me to look at B Corps companies. They were very good in creating the first hundred million business, but then it became too complex. They might have become global or 
know, or the legal sites. And so, so they often came to us and asked if we would, uh, in fact, that's how seventh generation came, but it was a B Corp where uh, they asked if they could be part of Unilever. And I saw that happening a few times where our strong values, our reputation actually attracted companies to us. My spiel was always, it's better to be a long-term part of Unilever than to be in the hands of private equity and have to auction yourself off every seven to 10 years and, uh, and build something with purpose-driven people. And that was a good selling spiel that worked. Uh, we could never get the whole company to move, but we had the best and first B Corp, which was Ben and Jerry's, which is the ultimate, in my opinion, where selling ice cream is an excuse for being an activist. And uh, sometimes they get themselves in trouble, but most of the time they, uh, they fight for the right causes that I actually were bleeding to 75 when I came, punching well above their weight. And when I left, they were over 1.4 billion and growing very fast. So this positioning as activist brand is appealing to a lot of people. Now, it might not be appealing to some, especially in some quarters of the political spectrum, but uh, we don't mind. If you don't have an edge and stand for something, uh, then it's very difficult nowadays to be successful. Which brings us to a whole other topic of, uh, of the attacks on ESG and wokeism and cancel cultures and anti-ESGs, but that's for a separate topic. All right, I think we have time for one last question from Andre Bittencourt. Thanks. Well, I'm calling from Grenoble and, and I'm attending the executive meeting at AGC Paris. Uh, thanks for the time, Paul, and great talk. Uh, and I have been wondering with this puzzle myself a lot uh, because I'm working in technology and I see this rapid advancement of exponential technologies. And, and I keep wondering how could we use that or to use the principles of stakeholder natural capitalism uh, to employ these principles to ensure that these innovations help reduce wealth inequality rather than exacerbate it in this exponential world. Also, uh, do you think we could see exponential growth which is based on shared value rather than on consumerism? The second part, I'm not fully understanding what you what the question is. Uh, exponential growth. What is your second um, question? That we could keep our economies growing uh, based on shared value rather than on consumption. Yeah. Just buying more so, goods and so on. Yeah. So, so let me start there. Our our incentive system is wrong. I, I previously alluded to this already. When Simon Koshnick invented the GDP concept around the end of World War II, he it was really um, created to measure industrial output. He said, never use this to measure success of a country. At that time, obviously, we came out of the war and industrial output, the economies were different, was an indicator of economic activity, but never about the well-being of a country. <coughs> he says it doesn't measure income inequality. It doesn't take care of limited uh, resources, uh, negative externalities, and the list went on. Unfortunately, we made that holier than the Bible and define success a little bit too narrowly. We did the same in companies where we define success with only one variable of capital, which was financial capital. So we do need to broaden that. And what we increasingly see is from countries as far away as uh, New Zealand to Iceland to the Nordic countries here to uh, France, actually, where you're calling from and many others, that governments are broadening their their definitions. And one thing that I'm excited about and and sorry, broadening the definitions of success. And that is badly needed and increasingly uh, put their, their monetary and fiscal policies, their government policies in the broader sense around a, a broader measure. Some politicians still struggle with that, but the ones that are starting to do it do do very well. In fact, if you look at the sustainable development goals, and you look at countries that have been most advanced in implementing these sustainable development goals, i.e. these broader measures, are also the countries where you actually have the higher uh, happiness of the population. <coughs> and the countries that continue to be narrow, you see happiness as a, as a population decline quite rapidly. Uh, so, so 
I think more people are starting to understand that success needs to be defined differently. And there's no reason why you can't do that in a company either, as we've talked about. And the ones that do that are, are frankly, getting rewarded for it because they're more aware of some of these challenges out there. And, and so they better internalize that. They provide better plans. And ultimately, that gets translated into better results. On your first part of inequality, I could not agree more. Inequality is going up. Uh, actually, it's going up within countries even more so than between countries and it's now become a global issue in the us there's 60 million americans that live below the poverty line that can't that don't have enough for decent uh, de uh, don't, don't have enough money to feed their people uh, one in five children goes to school without breakfast so you know 80 million are 500 dollars away from poverty the car needs to break down or they need to have a, a health emergency and, and they're toast and uh, increasingly you see them on the streets of Seattle, LA and California or San Francisco. And I know many that believe in the American dream want to make it wish it would go away, but it doesn't go away by wishing. We really need to ensure that in everything we do, including in anything that companies do, that we have a human angle in there. And in Unilever, I set a target of creating 5 million jobs especially in Africa. I put that in a gender lens by being sure that 50%, because it was for us mainly smallholder farmers, that 50% were women. So um, if we, uh, in our value chain, we talk about livable wages. We were the first company that actually created the uh, Livable Wage Alliance to create standards for the world. But we, we wanted to be sure that everybody had access to that, that everybody had access to a toilet, that everybody had access to nutritious food. So whatever you do, I think you need to take that human lens into, into account. And uh, especially with the transition of the global economy now, where we need to decarbonize it, where we need to get out of fossil, close coal mines, for example, get out of some industries that have been high emitting to the new future economy, there will be winners and losers. And if you don't take care of the losers, um, then they will only become opposition. They will only resist that change. Um, so any change that you make has to be just. That is what is called a just transition. Um, the, the big mistake we made on globalization was, of course, it's good to globalize. Of course, it built the global economy in ways that we could have never done it. But if you don't take care of the people that are disrupted and that fall behind as a result of these changes or these shifts, in uh, relative uh, economic forces, then ultimately it, it will result in rejection or rebellion. And that is what you see. I've always said that any system where too many people feel they're not participating or where they feel that they're left behind will ultimately rebel against itself. And that's happening in different forms. To some extent, Brexit was a rebellion. To some extent, the voting in some countries for extreme political parties is a rebellion. So it's better, I think, for all of us, including for business, to continuously ensure that we drive to this more equitable society. And, you know, and it makes business sense as well. If, if more people are able to participate in these global economies, then the markets for businesses will also be bigger and healthier. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's done in a sustainable way. Great. A couple of quick comments before we thank you, Paul. Uh, C.K. Prahlad, my former colleague from the University of Michigan, wrote the book uh, about value or wealth at the bottom of the pyramid. I can't remember the exact title, but uh, yeah. it's consonant with what uh, Paul Pullman just said. Regarding GDP, wow, that's a big topic. Um, my former colleague at University of Chicago, Kevin Murphy, he's a Clark medalist, current colleague, William Nordhaus here at Yale have looked at the benefits of improvements in health, which are totally missed by GDP. So, and, and the harms to health and well-being are completely missed by GDP. So th those are a couple uh, notes. Um, Paul, I wanna thank you. Uh, on behalf of the lucky 25 students in this new elective, I think we, we had uh, a lot of really good uh, comments from the chat. 
um, you know, over 150 people joining via Zoom from around the world, plus an unknown number of people in our breakout rooms here at Yale School of Management. Thank you so very much. We, we hope that your talk with Japan goes well. We're very grateful for your time and travel well to New York. Thank you, Paul Bowman. Thank you and thank you for what you're doing. Appreciate it. And hopefully see you soon in person, uh, Teth and the others. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you.